Patients who have Hashimoto's thyroid disease often suffer with a wide number of gastrointestinal problems. One of the problems that I routinely see in my patients with Hashimoto's thyroid disease is acid reflux. And if you're like most people who uh, suffer and, and experience acid reflux, then you're most likely under the assumption that this pain in the middle of your chest, this burning, this belching, this dyspepsia, this bloating, and then of course this regurgitation is all caused by excess stomach acid. In other words, too much stomach acid. And of course, if this is what you've been told and led to believe, thanks to the millions of dollars spent uh, you know, from pharmaceutical companies and drug companies uh, on TV ads and TV commercials and magazine ads, then you're probably going to believe that antacids are the cure uh, and, the, and the proper treatment for this problem. In today's video, I wanna share with you just some of the information that you've probably never heard of uh, before. And this, of course, could be a massive game changer for you, possibly life-saving for you in the sense that not only will it prevent this acid reflux, but it will fix many other health problems. I'm Dr. Hagmeyer, I'm the clinic director here at drhagmeyer.com, where we help patients from all over the world find answers and find natural solutions to problems like Hashimoto's thyroid disease and acid reflux. Today's video is going to cover a lot of information on the connection between Hashimoto's disease and acid reflux. Some of the topics uh, in today's video that we're going to talk about include the causes of acid reflux, of course, when it's not caused by too much acid, problems with taking antacids and proton pump inhibitors and acid blockers, especially when you take these for more than three or four months. Um, I'll also explain to you why stomach acid is just so critical to your health, and of course, and your immune system when you have Hashimoto's disease. Next, I'll explain to you why taking certain uh, probiotics and enzymes like betaine, HCL, and pepsin, like I said, can be an absolute life changer for those of you who suffer with acid reflux. I'll also talk about who needs to take uh, betaine, HCL, and pepsin, and why. And finally, if you stay with me to the end, I'm going to share with you a link that you can download uh, a free guide with all kinds of strategies uh, with suggestions and tips on how to improve your acid reflux naturally. So let's jump into this and make sense of all this for you. Let's obviously start with some of the real reasons, uh, some of the real root causes of each month 60 million Americans suffer with acid reflux. And so the number one is this overgrowth of H. pylori. H. pylori is a bacteria. It's one of the most common, 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 it's one of the most common chronic bacterial infections in the stomach. And it affects more than 50% of the world's population. H. pylori is more common in patients with Hashimoto's and hypothyroidism. It's one of the biggest problems with H. pylori infection is that in H. pylori bacteria can actually promote acid reflux because this bacteria is so smart. This bacteria is capable of shutting down um, the acid producing cells of your stomach, right? There's an enzyme called urease and it shuts down your stomach's production of hydrochloric acid. Now, most people think that acid reflux is caused by too much acid, but the truth of the matter is, is that too little stomach acid causes acid reflux. Actually, not only uh, does too little stomach acid and too little stomach acid production cause acid reflux, but if the pH of your gut leans towards alkalinity, like when you take these acid blockers or antacids, you can also develop acid reflux. Here's what we know. People who have Hashimoto's thyroid disease often have more flare-ups when infected with H. pylori uh, and other intestinal bacteria. We also know that people who have Hashimoto's disease also tend to be at higher risk for other autoimmune diseases, such as atrophic gastritis, pernicious anemia, and even celiac disease. But here's why stomach acid is so vital. And when you have thyroid disease, um, and you may wanna write this down, there are three main reasons why stomach acid enzymes are, are vital. Number one, number one is digestion, right? You can't break down the protein you eat without stomach acid enzymes. All right, so that's why, that's number one. Number two, stomach acid enzymes allow the vital nutrients such as vitamins and minerals to be absorbed. That's another reason why we need that, those stomach acid, that stomach acid. And number three, stomach acid enzymes sterilize the contents of the digest, digestive tract and they protect you 
from harmful bacteria like H. pylori, like parasites. And if you don't break down dietary proteins because of too little stomach acid uh, and not insufficient enzymes, these undigested or these partially digested proteins can cause damage to your small intestines. They can be one of the major culprits or the major causes of leaky gut. So just like you see in this picture here, the damage to the small intestines allows these proteins to enter the general circulation into your bloodstream. And this is where a chain reaction or this domino effect of inflammation, immune system activation, food allergies all develop. This becomes a vicious cycle. The undigested or partially digested dietary proteins, they damage the gut lining, causes leakiness in the gut. The leaky gut allows the proteins to leak into the bloodstream. This sets off an inflammatory reaction and now you develop sensitivities to all kinds of foods and all kinds of environmental chemicals. Keep in mind this, is that while you take antacids, they can bring temporary relief, but they'll also worsen your acid reflux problems long term. Because again, they make your stomach environment more alkaline. The stomach was never designed to be alkaline, and when it becomes more alkaline, People with thyroid disease end up with all kinds of vitamin and mineral deficiencies. One specific mineral deficiency that's important for immune function, important for uh, those people with Hashimoto's, of course, is zinc, right? Zinc is incredibly important to not only the, um, to the thyroid, but it's also important to the healing of the gastrointestinal lining and all the other mucosal tissues of the body for that matter. If you ever have a sore throat, you take zinc lozenges, right? Um, you have respiratory tract infections. You take zinc, right? Because zinc helps heal, speed up the healing of soft tissues. Um, things like ulcerations, H. pylori, and so forth. Zinc's been shown, again, also to have antioxidant properties. It's been shown to, again, strengthen the uh, intestinal mucosal defenses. It buffers gastric acid. It maintains a healthy inflammatory immune reaction within the body. It speeds up the reaction of injured, erosed tissues. Right? All those things I just mentioned. Now, when you take antacids and proton pump inhibitors for several months, like many, many people do, uh, you end up with a zinc deficiency. This is also why people who use antacids and proton pump inhibitors, they have weaker bones. They develop osteoporosis. They're at increased risk of food poisoning. They develop that leaky gut that I just mentioned. They develop small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that I just talked about. This is why zinc is so very important. Number two, another potential cause of your acid reflux uh, when you have Hashimoto's thyroid disease is the protein that's found in wheat, rye, and barley. Um, this is your gluten proteins. Studies show a strong correlation between gluten intolerance and Hashimoto's hypothyroidism. In fact, if you have Hashimoto's hypothyroidism, a strict gluten-free diet can help you manage the underlying immune component of this disease. And in turn, um, this can have far-reaching effects on your acid reflux. Now, if you have thyroid disease and you still eat any of these gluten-containing grains and you still suffer with acid reflux, at some point, I want you to read the article that I wrote titled Seven Things You Never Knew About Acid Reflux, GERD, and Gluten. I'll leave a link for you uh, in, the, in this article in the YouTube description section. But let me just say this, is that for the purpose of today's video, gluten is a highly, highly inflammatory protein. Gluten has been shown to cause leaky gut. It's been shown to inflame the mucosal tissues. It flares up the immune system. It increases the damage to your thyroid. So these are all reasons why you should consider a gluten-free anti-inflammatory diet. Now, you might remember earlier where I said that people who have Hashimoto's often have other associated autoimmune diseases like celiac disease. This is again a very common amongst those people with thyroid disease. But how does this relate to acid reflux? Well, let's look at this study that you can see here that's found, that found that chronic acid reflux affects 30% of patients with celiac disease compared to less than 5% of those that are not diagnosed with celiac disease. Here's another study that showed almost 40% of children with celiac disease also suffer from esophagitis. 
Um, this is where there is a massive inflammatory immune reaction going on within the esophagus itself. This, of course, can cause acid reflux, can cause heartburn, can cause bloating. And then again, of course, that can lead to infections as well. Now, another common cause of acid reflux that I want you to be aware of, uh, and this is number three, this is something called pernicious anemia. And this is a conversation I've been having with a lot of patients over the last couple of weeks. And so I felt it was really important that if you are a person that has acid reflux and bloating, um, you frequently have, let's say, low vitamin B12 levels, you're always getting those B12 shots to feel more energized. Now, I bring this up because, again, just a few weeks ago, uh, I, I ran some testing on a patient who had a long history of B12 deficiency, a long history of zinc deficiency, was always sick, was always coming down with a cold, always having respiratory tract infections. And it turns out that she had pernicious anemia. And if you've never heard of pernicious anemia, pernicious anemia essentially is where the immune system attacks the cells in your, in your gut called the parietal cells. And again, this is an autoimmune disease seen very commonly in patients with Hashimoto's disease. Now, parietal cells are the cells in the stomach that produce hydrochloric acid. And if your immune system is destroying these cells, like we see in pernicious anemia, then those parietal cells are not producing hydrochloric acid. It also means that your gut is not acidic. Food is not being digested. Nutrients are not being absorbed. You're not absorbing those vitamins and minerals that require an acidic environment, like iron and B12 and vitamin C, and even foods. And now because you're not properly digesting your food, some of the acid that's in your gut backwashes into the esophagus. That becomes an inflamed, delicate tissue. And so again, this process continues over and over and over again. So if any of what I just told you sounds familiar, you have symptoms of acid reflux, you have Hashimoto's disease, you have frequent low levels of B12, maybe low levels of zinc, then this is something that I want you to discuss with your doctor. Hopefully, um, your doctor won't miss this. Uh, that, you know, hopefully they won't miss this. Um, you know, being a good doctor requires investigation, requires a good history. And if your doctor's too busy, you know, and doesn't spend that time being a good investigator, they may not be able to put the pieces of the puzzle back the way they should, all right? So this is another problem that I want you to know uh, is that is if you take proton pump inhibitors and antacids uh, as it relates to thyroid disease, unfortunately, chronic use of these proton pump inhibitors, these PPIs, also disrupt a person's microbiome, all right? Boy, oh boy, the microbiome is absolutely critical uh, in helping your body fight off intestinal infections. But it's also a major area of importance whenever we're talking about an autoimmune disease. And that's because 80% of our immune system is in our guts, which means that we can't have, uh, or I should say it means that we can have a substantial impact on our immune system by focusing in on gut health. Right? The autoimmune disease that you might have, whatever autoimmune disease that is, can be improved, perhaps stabilized, perhaps even reversed by improving your gut health. But if you're someone who is using proton pump inhibitors and other acid blocking medications, the job of improving your immune system and stabilizing your immune system just became more challenging. I want you to take a look at this study here on the effects of proton pump inhibitors on the microbiome. You can see here that in this study, you see that they took 211 people who were currently using proton pump inhibitors. Um, these people had stool samples done and within that stool sample, what they found is all kinds, what, they, what you should find is all kinds of good bacteria. That's what we want to see, hopefully, right? Essentially, a stool test provides valuable insight into the health and the terrain of your gut. Now, in my opinion, it's one of the most important tests for, for patients with autoimmune diseases. But what they found was that in this group of people that were using proton pump inhibitors, what they found is that they had significantly higher amounts of bacteria associated with disease compared to people who did not take proton pump inhibitors. On stool sampling, they found higher amounts of bacteria such as Enterococcus, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, and E. coli, as well as C. diff. Now, these are all kinds of bacteria that are also associated with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. As someone who suffers with Hashimoto's, you don't want an overabundance of these bacteria. This is not helping your acid reflux. It's not helping your, your, your autoimmune disorder. It's not helping your thyroid. If we look at the conclusion of this study, 
you can see here is that the difference between proton pump inhibitor users and non-users observed in the study are consistently associated with changes towards a less healthy gut microbiome. These differences are in line with known changes that predispose individuals to C. diff infections and can potentially explain the increased risk of enteric infections in proton pump, and in proton pump inhibitor users. On a population level, the effect of proton pump inhibitors are more prominent than the effects of antibiotics or other commonly used drugs. If you've used a lot, if you have a lot of GI problems, I should say, at some point, I recommend that you watch a video that I did on the 10 most common intestinal and gut issues seen in patients with Hashimoto's and thyroid disease. There is so much good information packed into that video where I go through the 10 most common problems that we see uh, in those patients. So back to this acid reflux for just a minute here. What can you do, right? Well, number one is in order to improve acid reflux, um, we have to improve low stomach acids. And one of the things you can start doing is supplementing with something called betaine HCL and pepsin. Betaine HCL and pepsin are naturally occurring compounds within the gastric juice, right? They help you break down large proteins into smaller proteins and then finally into amino acids. Essentially what these enzymes do, pepsin and, and HCL, is they're, they're like scissors. They come along and they, and they basically chop up these proteins and snip them into smaller protein subunits that can now be easily uh, absorbed and, and better digested. Uh, and by the way, this also helps if you have a leaky gut. So remember what I said earlier, that is if you have large undigested proteins, these undigested proteins causing this leaky gut drive inflammation, they drive food sensitivities, they drive allergies, and ultimately they fire up this progression of this autoimmune disease. Betaine HCL and pepsin is also important for proper absorption of calcium, uh, B12, things like iron, and many other vitamins and minerals that we often see deficient in patients with hypothyroidism. How often do we see iron anemia uh, in patients with thyroid disease and Hashimoto's disease? How often do we see low B12 levels in patients with Hashimoto's and, and low thyroid? Almost always, I, I would almost venture to say that if you're watching this video today, if you've had recent blood tests, take a look at your B12 levels, take a look at your iron levels. You know, were your B12 levels, you know, in the 500, 600 range, were they lower? Or were they up in the 1000 range where they actually belong? Where were your iron levels? You know, were your ferritin levels, your iron storage levels, were they on the low end, all right? All of these things could be a sign of something more serious going on. Now. Let me share with you five ways uh, supplementing with betaine, HCL, and pepsin may help you. Right? As you begin to digest your proteins better, those proteins are more efficiently broken down into amino acids. If you are a patient of mine, you know that I like looking at amino acid levels. Amino acids are your building blocks for hormones. They're your building blocks for brain and gut neurotransmitters. They're the building blocks for the immune system. They're the rebuilding blocks for repairing DNA. Better digestion and more acid leads to more energy. This means more of your body being able to, you know, not, not wasting energy on, on things that it doesn't need to. Um, digestion is a very labor intensive process, right? So digestion requires just an awful amount of ATP and energy in your body. And the more efficient you become in digestion, the more energy you have to be utilized in other areas of your body. Number three, better digestion and more acid of proteins lead to a healthier immune system response, especially to foods. If foods are not properly being broken down, they can become more immune reactive in your body, right? And this is what sets off this hypervigilant immune reaction to foods where you start out being maybe sensitive to just one food. And then next year, you're sensitive and allergic to tons of foods. Then you're sensitive to all kinds of environmental chemicals, right? People with autoimmune diseases have immune systems that are often reacting uh, to foods, reacting to tissues, and reacting to these environmental triggers in a non-descript way. Number four, better digestion means less bloating, and less bloating means less chances of developing not only food cravings, but also less chance of developing SIBO, or that small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. SIBO is a big problem for people with Hashimoto's and people with hypothyroidism. 
And again, one of the causes behind this small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is this ileocecal valve. When you're bloated, what happens is this ileocecal valve stays open. This open valve, okay, the ileocecal valve is a valve between the small intestines and the large intestines. If the pressure keeps this ileocecal valve open, what happens is bacteria in the large intestines migrate up into the small intestines where they don't belong. And then they begin to ferment carbohydrates and starches, begin to produce hydrogen and methane, and this is what causes the bloating, the secondary bile acids, and all the other kinds of problems that we see, even things like fat malabsorption, which I talked about in a previous video. Number six, less systemic inflammation equals less pain. Are you somebody out there who has fibromyalgia or lupus or rheumatoid arthritis, right? If we can reduce systemic inflammation, not only can we calm down the immune system, uh, we can reduce the damage to the tissues in the body. And that's really what pain is. Pain is the result of tissue damage. Now you may remember earlier in the video, I spoke about the importance of why the gut needs to be acidic. Uh, as it relates to the absorption of B12 and as it relates to the absorption of zinc. Well, I said that if we don't have proper production of stomach acid, then we end up with B12 deficiencies and zinc deficiencies and calcium deficiencies and magnesium deficiencies. So that's another reason, right? B12 and magnesium uh, are very, very important for, again, uh, systemic managing systemic inflammation, okay? Very, very important. So the other thing is we know that B12 levels also play a role in, in preventing hyperhomocysteinemia. This is where, and I've talked about this in past videos, where high levels of homocysteine, which is a, a vascular marker, it's a marker that should be done on every patient with thyroid disease, every patient with um, high cholesterol, every patient that has an autoimmune disorder, because it's an independent risk factor for coronary artery disease, stroke, deep vein thrombosis, and for arterial and venous clotting, all right? So what does this have to do with stomach acid? Well, it all comes back to what you're absorbing. Stomach acid production is increased with supplemental betaine, HCL, and pepsin. This allows for better absorption of that B12, which helps reduce those homocysteine levels. And we don't want to make, we want to make sure that those homocysteine levels don't get too high. Now, if you want more information on understanding the connection between MTHFR, thyroid disease, and heart disease, you can watch the video, uh, again, on my YouTube channel where I talk specifically about this and the concerns that we have in terms of why thyroid patients are at increased risk for things like heart disease and increased things like strokes. Part of it is due to the inflammatory reaction, all right? Again, I'll leave that in the description box. So while there are some great benefits of supplementing with uh, digestive enzymes, such as betaine HCL and pepsin, what is good for one person is not always good for everybody. You know, that's my mantra. I continue to say that over and over in my office. So here's the thing. Here's why you shouldn't take betaine HCL and pepsin. So number one is if you have any kind of bleeding ulcers, if you have peptic ulcers, if you've been diagnosed with gastritis, if you are currently using steroids or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, these again are all reasons why you don't want to use them. If you have any of these conditions that I just mentioned, you should first talk to your treating doctor about using betaine HCL and pepsin. Now I realize that this video is getting a little bit long and rather than making a whole nother video that where I just you know start listing off all these different um, supplements that you should be taking, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a, a, another um, handout uh, which basically you can download and it'll be called five favorite strategies for improving acid reflux naturally. Again, this will be a free PDF download um, if you can't download it, can't find it, please email our office, use the contact, uh, contact us now. We'll make sure we get you out a copy of that. But again, you can print that up, you can implement some of those strategies. And so again, I hope you found this video helpful. I know this one was a little bit long, but I want you to realize that there's so much that can be done um, for acid reflux and for people that, that struggle with this, all right? So there you go. I hope you liked today's video. If you did, be sure to comment below um, I do try to respond to questions as best I can. Make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. Again, if you have any questions about working with me or working with one of my nutritionists in my practice, um, whether you need help implementing, again, a, a certain kind of diet to, to help your body heal, 
or you're looking to deep uh, dig deeper into the root cause of some of your health problems with testing, uh, visit our website, click on the Start Here button, tell us a little bit about what you're struggling with, what kind of help you're looking for, how we can best help and best support you, and we'll get, an information, um, we'll get some information out to you in an email. So I hope you enjoyed today's video. Until next time, I'm Dr. Hagmeyer. Take care.